The chairperson for the session is Dr. V. C. Prakash, currently working in Indian Academy Degree College, Autonomous in Bangalore. He did his PhD at Annamalai University. His specialization is American Literature and ELT. He has published several articles in national and international journals and conducted research papers at various conferences. I welcome you, sir, to this session. Sir? Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, we will uh, begin uh, this session, technical session, uh, with the research scholars and uh, professors. The first, I would like to invite uh, uh, paper presenter. Uh, Saristi Joshi, a research scholar, Punjab University. The topic of the paper is gender and culture with a special reference to female phyticide and dowry murderers in North India. So the research scholar can go ahead with the research paper. Uh, thank you, sir. And good evening to all. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you can go ahead. Okay, okay. So my topic is on uh, gender and culture with the special reference to female feticide and dowry murders in North India. So India is one of the largest democratic nation of the world, which is also famous for its cultural and traditional outlook. Culture in some way is known as a state of mind which is practiced and shared by the members of the society. No culture can work without the presence of individuals of different genders. Now gender, and we have uh, various different notions of gender and sex. So gender is considered as a social concept, whereas sex is a biological concept. Male and female are denoted as uh, the sex of a particular individual, whereas women and man denotes the gender of an individual. And this difference is being given by Robert Stoller in 1939. All living organisms are the beautiful creation of Almighty, and females are his most wonderful creation on this planet, as they have been adorned with the power to bring a new life. The male domination in the society have always been associated with women, with the production of children, cooking, taking care of men, and have always been excluded them from the high position occupation, which are holding powers. Women have always been considered inferior to man. The patriarchy has played a major role in the exploitation of the women. As culture is also considered a state of mind, the patriarchal mindset has always shown their dominance over the women of the society and India has witnessed its horrific effects too. The northern part of India have always been invaded and conquered quite frequently because of the northwest frontier and by various foreign rulers, leading to a major threat of women's security of the country. During the medieval period and the coming of the Mughals in India, and from there onwards, the exploitation of the women was started. Many evil practices were being started by the family members of the female itself. For example, sati, sati pratha, child marriage, killing of the daughters, and many other. And it was all practiced by the re regional men itself. And it was considered that it is better to kill one's own daughter or a wife or a daughter-in-law rather than to hand over them to the Mughals. Abduction, kidnapping, rapes, forced sexual slavery, and many other practices were, were being performed by the Mughals of the by the Mughals on the females of northern India. North India region ha was highly affected therefore the male members of the society started keeping their women within the four walls. There was no concept of parda system in the in, in India but with the coming of the Mughals the female has to put parda on her face and the females were forced to do only the household cures and nothing else. 
and with the passage of time their sort of practices these sort of practices become so rigid that it took a form of a culture instead according to which men are made to rule and whereas women are made to serve them delhi being the center of interest of every foreign ruler was hit the hardest by the patriarchal ideology of the mughal rulers which explains how gender practices have degraded and endangered women including dowry deaths sun preference leading to female feticides inadequate health care the peripheries of the capital namely haryana rajasthan punjab uttar pradesh are the areas which were highly affected by the patriarchal ideological culture with regular incidents of violence against the females a few horrific cases which got noticed are according to times of india 2013 in lucknow the threat to bahu and beti that is daughter in law and daughter in west up is actually from their families itself female feticide dowry deaths together kill one bahu one beti that is one uh, daughter in law and a daughter every 4 minutes in the a in these areas according to a sample every day feticide kills 330 unborn girls in up poor maternal health 46 women are facing this problem and dowry six women total 382 women per day are being facing all these problems in up now in haryana 1998 the female feticide is at such high rates that the young males do not have any girl left in the village to get married every village has practiced the female feticide so there is no girl left to be to be married and every male is facing this problem punjab and ludhiana according to india new uh, india news july 8 2021 report a woman was burned to death allegedly over dowry by her in laws in the ludhiana district of punjab in rajasthan a very very uh, important case and uh, this is uh, the case of bhavri devi where she is a social worker and bhavri devi an indian social worker from bateri village rajasthan who was gang raped in 1992 by the men angered by her efforts to prevent child marriage in their family so these these rigid practices are being performed every day within the peripheries in the center of delhi just and this is being expected that this is all because of the mughal ideology of patriarchal cultures now the conclusion is thus with this we can conclude that when the evil practices begins i becomes the ideology of an individual and when ideology becomes the culture of an individual that evil monsters can never be killed it will always be seen in a different forms and types but will never go anywhere so thank you uh thank you ma'am for your uh, presentation thank on uh, on uh, the title uh, gender and culture with a special reference to female feticide and dowry murders in north uh, india so you have focused on uh, the patriarchal mind in uh, north india the how child marriages uh, killing daughters and uh, daughter in laws yes. so so all this uh, Uh, ideas uh, have been covered up. Uh, yes. Do they have these issues uh, till today, uh, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is. It is. It is. Horrible some got that. registers and some do not got uh, registered, but they there are issues. Yes. Okay. Horrible situations. Uh, for yeah, how can we, ma'am? How can we remove these issues? Is there any possibility? so this is what i have concluded this issue cannot be removed see i have told you how a woman uh, she is a, a social worker and in 1992 she was being gang raped because she was fighting for a child marriage why child marriage is happening and still now the rajasthan areas are been facing all these problem during the lockdown a 8 year girl was was being married to a 25 years old man ma'am so, <laughs> yes ma If the yes, most sir. fantastical thing is that it is written in Manusriti, Nari Tome Narayani. Ah, yes. And again, it is written in various types of manuscripts. 
प्रतिर्जा संगमात पूर्व दर्शन श्रवण दिजा तयरस मिलती प्राज्ञ पूर्व राग शौचते इट मीन उमेन आर मोर पावरफुल उमेन हेव द मोस्ट एसेंशियल थिंग इन दिस वर्ल्ड इवन इन आवर कल्चर एवरीथिंग गोज टू उमेन फिनेंसियल डिपार्टमेंट गोज टू गडेस लक्ष्मी एडुकेशनल डिपार्टमेंट गोज टू गडेस सरस्वती so it is sarcastical total sarcastical until yes. we cannot remove these types of things from our brain mm. we cannot go forward ma'am i think it is my personal view exactly exactly that is what i was saying sir if the ideology has become such that that women is meant to be under our feet so nobody can change that if the ideology is like which which you are saying that women but, is but, but ma'am we have to change this we have yes. to change this Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. I agree. We have to change this, and we cannot. We cannot see our next is... generation. We cannot see our next generation face the same problem, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am agreeing your your point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, other uh, participants. Uh, anybody has uh, the question on this uh, uh, paper? If you have, you can uh, raise the question, and you can have also the comments on. the presentation okay i think uh, nobody has okay uh, thank you ma'am uh, saristi uh, joshi ma'am uh, we can uh, move towards the next uh, research uh, scholar thank you thank you thank you raymond sir thank you prakash sir thank you um the next uh, paper presenter is anju devadas rd a research scholar um mar ivonis college trivandrum the topic of the research paper is uh, the phallic camera and uh, the statistic uh, voyeurism of the female body an exploration of uh, sexually male gaze in malayalam uh, cinema um so anju devadas can go ahead with uh, the uh, paper uh good afternoon sir Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Is my screen visible? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Ah, can you see the screen, please? Yes, ma'am. You can go ahead. Thank you. Ah, yes, uh, so the topic of my presentation is the phallic camera and the sadistic voyeurism of the female body an exploration of sexually assaultive male gaze in malayalam cinema uh the ideological construct of patriarchy that institutionalizes male dominance over women through the imposition of masculinity and femininity character stereotypes in society strengthens the inequitous power relations between men and women the subservient and subordinate social structural position of women in a patriarchal system of gender relation forces women to undergo repressive gender based oppression discrimination and objectification the male dominated male identified and male centered phallocentric society illustrates and teaches the general patriarchal principle that men are sexual subjects and women are sexual objects of erotic pleasure and male desire the patriarchal unconscious and the over emphasis of hegemonic masculinity has constructed a fragmented and distorted subjectivity for women that places women's bodies as vehicles of objectification and sexualization so for this paper i have taken two theories male gaze theory and also the sexual objectification theory so first i'll talk about uh, male gaze theory so laura malvi in her uh, ground breaking essay uh, which was published the year 1975 titled visual pleasure and narrative cinema she says that she bridges the psychic mechanism with the visual uh, experience or the viewing experience and she says that the 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 patriarchal male gaze governs all elements of cinema from production and presentation to viewing reception and discourse uh, according to malvi male gaze is the act of depicting women and the world in the visual arts and in literature from a masculine heterosexual perspective that presents and represents women as passive sexual objects for the pleasure of the heterosexual male viewer 
In narrative cinema, the sexual politics of the gays can be viewed from the perspective of three different looks. The perspective of the man behind the camera, the perspective of the male protagonist within the film, and the perspective of the spectator gazing at the visual. These are the three different looks that the, the, uh, that the cinema generates uh, in order to look at women. And in cinema, women are characterized by their to be looked at this. They are, they are sexual objects to be looked at. So they are characterized by their looked at -ness, where women is a spectacle and man is the bearer of the look. So women are bearers of meaning while men are makers of meaning. And women, women are not at all considered as makers of meaning because they are just for the sexual pleasure. And it suggests that women are not placed in, in a role where they can take control of the narrative or the scene. Instead, they are simply put, it, put there in order to be observed from an objective point of view. Coming to the sexual objective, so uh, coming to the theory of sexual objectification, which was um, uh, which was narrated by Fredrickson and Roberts, uh, it occurs when a woman's body, body parts or sexual functions are isolated from her whole and complex being and treated as objects simply to be looked at or coveted or touched. Once sexually objectified, the worth of the woman's body or body part is directly equated to the physical presence or the potential sexual function and it is treated solely for others to use and consume. So it is just a consum consumption product or a utilize. it is just a utility or a consumptive product which is used by the voyeuristic gaze of the spectators. Sexual objectification is very much closely related to the male gaze because the sole value of the objective gaze is to be enjoyed or possessed by the voyeur. Thus, the objectified figures are usually uh, devalued and their humanity is removed from them. When it comes to the women in media, the media and popular culture representation of women as erotic objects for the pleasure of the heterosexual male viewer emphasizes how the male gaze dehumanizes and disregards the female body as none other than a means of desire. The fragmentation and hypersexualization of the parts of the heat female body during sexual trappings or sexual violence or the flamboyant depredations lead to the sadistic and also fetishistic voyeurism of the sexual violence. So this paper is an attempt to analyze how the domineering gendered gaze of the camera lens establishes women as objects of scopophilia. Scopophilia is the uh, sexual pleasure that we get from uh, looking at some uh, looking at an object or a person and heterosexual men as bearers of the look, utilizing the objectification theory and uh, male gaze theory of Laura Mulvey. So when it comes to the male gaze uh, in Malayalam cinema, so the thematic representation of the sexual objectification and violence and the sexual assault, it has a long standing and also disquieting history in Malayalam cinema with the voyeuristic male gaze and the phallic lens dominating the visual scene and the misogynistic patriarch controlling the narrative. It is always the men who control the narrative and the visual scene will be dominated by the phallic gaze. That is the gaze of the man which is looking at the woman. And the sexually assaulted gaze, it is kind of a sine qua non of, of Malayalam cinema that features sexual assault and violence uh, more or less phallically. So the phallic camera is a voyeur acting as at the behest of the director, fixing the woman with a gaze she cannot escape from. So uh, when we look at the history of Malayalam cinema, in the 1970s and the 80s, uh, sexual assault and sexual violence was a staple in every mainstream Malayalam cinema at those times. So there, there were a lot of films like Lisa, Kantavalayam, Arhat, Aval Ravugal, then Periwariyambalam, Kaliyamardhanam, uh, Matuvin Chattangale, Aratri, Changatham, Nirakuta, E Shabdam, Innata Shabdam, Inim Kadatudarim, Karira Katupole, New Delhi, uh, Vindum Lisa. These are films where we, we could see a voyeuristic male look pleasuring at the uh, female body. So uh, I am giving you an example from the 1978 film Kantavalem, where we see a rich, spoiled businessman tycoon, which is portrayed by Jain. Uh, he takes a fancy to this beautiful receptionist played by Seema. And he, talk, he stalks her everywhere in the lift, at the hotel foyer, uh, on the road, and eventually he forces himself upon her. And apart from morbid picturization of the male gaze that sexualizes and victimizes the character, what is more revolting is the fact that uh, she's forced to sleep with them again and again and he she, she's paid for it and disgustingly at the end of the film she falls in love with him and she blushingly reminisces the 
in intimacy they shared it so it is kind of a male fantasy where uh, the camera lens is looking at the woman and the the woman is reciprocating so the phallic camera sexualizes sexually assaults women each time she is raped and the spectators become witnesses and eventually voyeurs identifying with the protagonist so the spectators also identifies the with the protagonist of the film and they also become uh, a witness in the sexual assault and according to neelima parvati uh, she has made a statement about this voyeurism what disturbs me is the voyeurism in them rape as such is a violent act it's difficult to show it without making us uncomfortable but the way it is portrayed is repulsive why do they need to show bare legs and cleavage to make the point across they make it worse and why should the survivor always be made to feel the shame so it is always the survivor whose victim shame who's blamed for the sexual assault that has happened to her and in the 1990s we also see the pattern never varied it was uh, the same the same pattern followed that of the 70s and the 80s the phallic lens captured the sexual violence that there was a terrifying bgm there is the helpless wailing woman clothes being torn apart from him uh, and also the men who are, who are looking and sniggering at her obnoxiously and also the after aftermath scenes also remained um, also showed the the scene of the rape so the rapist will be sipping up his pants he will be buttoning the shirt and he will be leering and leaving the scene where the sufferer will be weeping and with downcast eyes and also with a mangled mess of clothes so there are there are a lot of disturbing scenes that that have that were meant to be titillating for the spectators it was meant for a titillation so uh, in the 90s uh, in the 1990s uh, we can see a lot of uh, some films like vartamana kalam then padayam hitler bhuta kannadi vasanthi lakshmi pinayanam all these feature sexual violence and also sexual assault uh, uh, at the female body and how uh, the male gaze is used by the protagonist and in turn how it becomes the gaze of the spectator so in iv shashi's vartamana kalam which was released in the year 1990 we can see uh, it is one of the most sexist films of the uh, of the times and also it was very offensive where the central character is always sexually assaulted at every point of her life and she is even molested at her husband's grave so there is a repeated uh, repeated um, um, showcasing of how she is molested and raped uh, uh, she she goes through uh, rape uh, and she is pimped by uh, um, um, she is pimped by someone and also then she is gang raped so all these uh, are in order to uh, all these kind of evoke a kind of a titillation uh, for the spectators and when it comes to the 2000s and also the 2010s there were a lot of films like dada saheb indriyam kaata jambagam meesha madhavan chindamani kola case 2020 chempada venal maram paleri manikam oru padira kola badagathinte kada 22 female kottayam pudhiya pudhiya niyamam vanyam chola these all films uh, had uh, scenes of sexual assault and sexual violence and um, in the new age malayalam cinema the contemporary times of the malayalam cinema we see rape is uh, depicted as a salacious manner it is also depicted as a salacious manner but it has fallen out a bit because of the political correctness which is being uh, which is uh, which is uh, urging people not to look at women in a certain way and having said that we we see in putiyam niyamam uh, we see the the protagonist um, being raped uh, being gang raped and it is a sequence which stretches to 15 minutes and the this the build up is stretching for 15 minutes it's kind of a uh, 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 scope of elic pleasure the 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 characters are deriving a scope of elic pleasure and thereby the spectators also are also expecting the sexual violence and assault to conclude uh, the eroticization of women prior to sexual violence makes spectator essentially a voyeur the spectator is the voyeur position where uh, there are instances of sexual assault and violence on the screen the identification of the spectators are split between uh, the spectators can be the can be men and women and there is a polarity of the sadistic aggressive and controlling position there's a polarity between sadistic aggressive controlling position and the victimized suffering and the controlled position so the men usually will be taking the sadistic aggressive and also controlling position while women will be identifying with the victim most suffering and control position so camera uh, and male gaze make common sense in some act of aggression towards women so the phallic camera becomes a kind of a uh, aggressive force it is a aggressive device 
So the cinematic apparatus characterized by the fixing of the female body as the quintessential and also deeply problematic object of sight. And one of the uh, one of the suggestions that we can make for uh, for uh, destroying or uh, annihilating the male gaze is uh, the uh, we can urge is there there should be a lot of women filmmakers who should be coming into the scene and they should see they should make a female gaze uh, looking at how sensitively a woman should be portrayed uh, without any kind of um, scopophilia or voyeurism uh, so that's it thank you uh, thank you ma'am for your uh, elaborated uh, research paper on certain um, uh, things like a sexually male gaze in Malayalam uh, cinema. Um, so here, uh, the people uh, wanted to become celebrities um, because of various uh, reasons. So they are entering into the the industry, right? So yeah. Um, well, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, various reasons are there um, uh, for uh, women who uh, try to enter into the uh, film industry and. Uh, uh, after entering into the film industry, uh, many things uh, are going to be uh, happen without their knowledge because they um, enter and they fixed their profession will be in the film industry. They cannot uh, move, right? So uh, for that, uh, at the same time, uh, they wanted to see the fame, the name of uh, them. So such things, uh, I think, uh, happen in uh, different uh, movies, what are the mm -hmm. movies you have brought up. But the people have uh, both notions, uh, you know, negative and uh, positive on uh, these uh, issues. So uh, what do you have, uh, The what kind of notion do you have uh, on these uh, movies, uh, ma'am? Um, they are, they are narratives of sexual objectification and it portrays sexual assault and sexual violence in, in, in such a manner that uh, women are always objectified. They are the sexual objects of male desire and also sexual pleasure. Uh, by portraying them uh, as, uh, by portraying um, a sexual objectification of the female body what happens is that both the camera the director behind the camera uh, the main protagonist in the scene and also the spectators identify with this notion of the heterosexual male viewer so uh, what is happening is that um, the female characters in the films are just dehumanized they are objectified uh, for the pleasure of the male gaze This is the kind of characters oh. that we can see in Malayalam cinema from the 1970s. N now there is a there is a very welcoming change. Now there is um, uh, only only in a couple of films that we can see such a male gaze. Um, the the it is a welcoming change uh, when it comes to the industry. It is okay. because of the because we are demanding a lot of political correctness and also uh, we are questioning the gaze. Okay, good good efforts have been taken. Uh, is uh, any uh, participant has a question on this uh, research paper? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I just want to ask that since you mentioned a lot about the discourse of objectifications and the subjectification, how you are locating the theoretical framework of your paper with Sarah Ahmed's cul the cultural politics of emotion, where she has talked that the object basically transcends its meaning when it is imprinted by the subjectification then this object itself gets blurred and also since you have mentioned a lot about the subjectivity of the gaze how you think that as a woman or as a female who is trying to portray her emotional landscape uh, so uh, how uh, this overall discourse of, say, the soft touch can produce a con undercurrent of partial truth that can subdue the male gaze and provide its own critical discourses. Because I was watching a movie called uh, Urai that has that starred, I think, Parvati or someone. I'm just forgetting the name. So I could actually relate all these things and all these critical nuances so i would like to know your opinion in the same in the same thing yeah thank you uh were you talking about the subjectivity and objectivity 
yes 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 i'm talking about the subjectivity and objectivity in reference to the cultural politics of emotion that sara ahmed has uh, related extensively and she has also used the work of film media and also the art and different types of phenomenological study and she is extensively relating that object becomes an object when subject actually try to interpenetrate into its boundary so this overall discourse of object is not an object there is an association of subjectivity so it the high time so it is in the high time that uh, we should blur this difference between the objectifications and the subjectification and also like since you have talked a lot on this gaze or say the scopophilia so the notion of soft touch that donna haraway has also said that it creates a certain kinds of partial truth and that partial truth enable us to see things from below from below that means we are emphasizing on the feminist standpoint so do you feel that in the present scenario the malayalam cinema is changing some transformation in the cinematic gazes so i just want to know about your opinion okay uh, so kerala when when we talk about kerala it had a very uh, patriarchal past it had a pat- patriarchal past it it, um, it kind of celebrated the hetero patriarchy uh, and in 70s 80s and the 90s the the kind of um, the women characters we see in the screen they were usually meant to be objects of pleasure they are just um, they they don't have subjectivity they don't have character sketch that we can talk about when it comes to usually the men will be the one who will be making the uh, who will be uh, controlling the narrative and women who will be just um, as um, objects of decoration that's how it was portrayed and um, women were considered to be uh, objects who were to be honored and when their uh, when their honor is lost what happens is that um, they will be uh, they will be victimized they will be shamed uh, for their female body their body will be considered um, not a temple uh, um, it is considered to be something to be shamed at uh, and also to be victimized at so the narratives that came through the 70s 80s and the 90s showcase such kind of portrayals but in the 2000s and also the 2010s what we can see is that there is a shift in the narrative there are a lot of women women centric roles coming into the cinema and uh, it is uh, there is a lot of questioning and challenging of the conventional and traditional notions which which portrayed women as objects of pleasure now we are looking at women from another standpoint i was just mentioning that uh, how it has progressed it, Uh, i cannot say that it has been completely eliminated even uh, in the in uh, last year there was a movie called chola where um, the sexual assault and sexual uh, violence was po- portrayed in in uh, in the screen and we see a male gaze uh, it is not a very uh, sensitive and also um, Uh, 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 sensitive or soft touch that you mentioned there is no soft touch or sensitivity there is a very um, victim victimization and also the cruelty that we can see from the male gaze is very much evident from that the, uh, from that film so by portraying this what we can see is that the spectators also are also identifying with it we can uh, portray rape not not to be explicit um, when when such explicit and graphic details are portrayed there is a kind of a male gaze happening there. there we cannot avoid that uh, i am talking this from the feminist point of view but uh, when we look at from a general perspective itself we can see that in advertisements everywhere the male gaze is not there it is not simply in the uh, in the film medium uh, it is we can see in the uh, television it is there in the advertisement fashion everywhere male gaze is there so something that we can do uh, as uh, something uh, which can which can be an alternative or opposing force is that there should be more of a female gaze there should be more female directors there should be more women centric uh, portrayals where um, um uh, where male directors should look look to how women should be portrayed does that answer your question Yes, yes, it has answered my question. Thank you for your initiative to answer my question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, well. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, and next, uh, we will uh, move towards the uh, the next paper presenter. Uh, so, Vik uh, Datta, uh, PhD research uh, fellow, University of uh, Delhi. The topic of uh, the research is ensnared rebellion and analysis of 
Sarachandra, yeah, Sarachandra Chattopadhyay's uh, heroines in Hindi film adaptions. So I welcome the research papers to uh, bring uh, what is done on this uh, topic. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll just request you to let me know when two minutes or so are left of my time because there are many instances. And I don't want to rush through the analysis and the conclusion towards the end. So I'll just request okay. you to give me a reminder. Right. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my paper is on Sharachandra Chattopadhyay's heroines in Hindi film adaptation. And as it says, an ensnared rebellion there. So uh, Sharachandra Chattopadhyay's novels have been known for their simplicity. Part of it stems from their homely plots and characters. The author's work has been much acclaimed yeah. for a realistic, yeah, uh, okay, uh, for their realistic projection of life in the late 19th, early 20th century Bengal. The significant popularity of his novels came from the substantial possibilities of empathy with the characters featuring in them. Chattopadhyay's women characters have constituted a significant part of the discussions on his movie. They exist conflicting opinions on their nature and behavior. While some scholars believe that they were largely damsels in distress, confirming to the machinations of the socio-cultural ethos of the time, others have seen in them the burning fire of latent rebellion that would outright be manifest given the nature of an imminent exigency. Quote, uh, Shorachandra Chattabadhyay's fashioning of outspoken contemporary women was at a time when women's lives were mostly confined to their homes." Unquote. This paper seeks to examine this in connection to the film adaptations of these novels in Hindi cinema. Adaptation, as you know, is a common enough process that draws inspiration from a particular source, recreating it, often for a different medium. Shorachandra's novels have been adapted several times in Hindi cinema. The depiction of women characters in these films would be compared to the author's portrayal of them, and possible variations would be duly analyzed. The first instance would be of Boykunthirvil, which has been adapted as Sotela Bhai, the will of Boykuntha adapted as half stepbrother. In this film, uh, Bhavani, wife of Boykuntha, is more eminent and impactful in the film as compared to the novel. Her standpoints and perspectives are better voiced. The comparison of the film to Yashoda, the nurturer of Krishna, despite not having given him birth, reinforces Bhabani's role in her stepson Gokul's life. She sticks up for Gokul in every situation, even if it meant reprimanding her biological son Vinod in the process. So a mother who sticks up for her stepson over her own biological son, and this is better voiced when she goes against every odd and she wishes to uh, support her stepson just because he is right. In the second instance, Bindu Chele, which is Bindu's son, and Choti Bahu, which means younger daughter-in-law. In this film, not so much the protagonist, but rather a supporting character, Paro, a hugely magnified version of Elo Keshi, a forgettable character in Chotopadha's Her importance to the film tends to overshow the protagonist, lingering in the audience's mind long after the film concludes. With a mixture of humor, craftiness, and manipulation, Paro's character and role in the film are exaggerations. However, she's far more harmful than Elokichi. The filmmaker utilizes her as a plot function in various strategic situations and as the primary agent causing rifts between members in the household. The third film is Biraj Bo, which translates into Biraj Bahu. Uh, the character's name is also incidentally Biraj. And this woman is a thorough housewife. And the greater control that she shows in the household space establishes her authority. This control is greater in the film than in the book. More importantly, more than Biraj also is this additional character of Sundari or Shundori in the Bengali novel, who is the servant of the house. And hers is more interesting than Biraj even because the terms in the film establish her character as one who is willing to pimp for the zamindar 
to land her ex-mistress. The zamindar is this man who has his eyes set on Biraj for a very long time. And Biraj, knowing this, knowing Shundari's complicity, throws her out of her job. And then she goes there to take revenge on him, uh, to take revenge on her. So, so Shundari is willing to pimp for the zamindar to land her ex-mistress Biraj in his souls. Shundari decides to avenge her unjustified banishment. And she has her moment when Biraj shares a story upon meeting her at the riverbank. In the novel, Biraj silently accompanies Shundari to the Zamindar's barge. Whereas in the film, it is Shundari who coaxes her into going with her. The filmmaker abdicates Biraj of her responsibility to her fainting fit, but endows Shundari with the task of having her carried to Devadhar, the Zamindar, thereby fulfilling her task. So again, a woman with greater agency than the novelistic portrait. In Devdas's 1936 adaptation, which is by Pramothesh Barua, E.C. Barua, in this film, Paro dominates the narrative through her role, personality, perspective, and action. The film begins with her. The very first shot focuses only on Paro. Most of the dialogues, even the best and most prominent ones, were given to her. It has even been said that E.C. Barua was writing more of Parvati's story than of Devdas. So the film is called Devdas, but the story being written appears to be that of Parvati because of the kind of focus that is there on her. In 1955, the adaptation of Devdas by Bimal Roy, uh, Chattopadhyay's young Parvati was far more selfless than Bimal Roy's. Okay, so uh, here we have a woman who would defend, in the novel, we would have a Parvati who would constantly defend Devdas from getting beaten, from getting into trouble with his father. But here, she goes and tells the father that, you know, Devdas has been having hookah, hiding in the woods. So clearly, the woman is not intent on saving her own, you know, is, is uh, kind of intent on saving her own skin more than that of Devdas. So clearly, a difference here. Moreover, uh, Paro's education is not stopped after Devdas quits the village. The director seems to have skipped the regressively inert role attributed to women and swapped it instead for a character who knew what she desired from the beginning. So Paro doesn't discontinue her education just because Devdas is no longer the attraction for her to go to the Pachana. Devdas and Das Tate, this is an adaptation lesser people know about, the 2018 spin on Devdas by Sudhir Mishra. Mishra's female lead, Paro, is a thorough firebrand who remains true to her ideals and personality for the entire duration. So Paro is not really as uh, many other adaptations have made her out to be meeker and you know uh, surrendering and begging Devdas for you know getting married to her, you know, the way it shapes up in the novel. But here she is she remains steadfast in her love for Dave, but she does not resist the mutual attempt to patch up their differences. And she does make it clear that she was in the relationship for the love, not for the servitude. She says, I would be your wife, but I would not be your nurse. The same Paro, insulted by, uh, you know, Dave's uncle, Avadhesh, once again, did not think twice before walking out on Dave, given that her self-dignity was compromised. For Paro, her ideals and virtues were too deeply rooted to interfere with her steadfastness of personality. She unvisedly sides with the truth, endowed with an unflinching sense of right and wrong. She doesn't compromise even for once. Similarly, Chandramukhi, in the film known as Chani, uh, is portrayed as a strategist who lays out a move-by-move -move advisory for Dave, a guiding force to chart each move to create a position of advantage for him, a fixer in the political party that Dave is a part of, and a manager to Dave as well, Mishra ensures that the strings of Dave's life continue to remain in her control. Additionally, she is pivotal enough to function as the narrator of the film. Chadni deserves due credit for strategizing Dave's establishment as a true political heir. In Mage Didi, Middle Sister, and Majli Didi, which is the equivalent in Hindi, Rishikesh Mukherjee's heroine is not only better illustrated than her literary counterpart, but also seems more emancipated endowed with greater voice and agency. This is about Himangini, who is Hema in the film. Uh, in Nishkriti, which, is, which means deliverance, 
and Apne Parai, our own and others, which is the film adaptation. Uh, we have Shailaja in the book and Sheila in the film. So the same equivalent characters. So Sheila's smart and deft nature is illustrated in her matter of fact detection of a child pretending to study in her presence when she turns his upturned book right. So the child is reading the book upside down. She goes and smartly turns the book around saying that, you know, I've seen through your game. This perhaps justifies Shridheshwari's, the elder Bahu's, judgment of her intelligence. She would have been a collector only if she were a man. This is not there in the book, by the way. These little attempts at adding detail enable viewers to gain a better understanding of her persona. Moreover, Basu Chatterjee, the director, adds to her character through the additional decision-making ability he entrusts her with. Her agency in saving her family in dire straits is commendable and relevant to the story. A brave face in front of her inconsolable children, followed by her breaking down upon her eldest brother-in-law's visit, strongly establishes personality and character. In Parinita, the 1953 adaptation by Bimal Roy, it is Girin who implicitly learns Lalita's truth. In the film, Lalita herself goes up to Girin to tell him her truth, revoking the possibility of their marriage. Lalita makes it very clear that she wouldn't hear a word of criticism about her husband or allow one to pass judgment on his actions. Irrespective of whether she was accepted, he would remain her husband. She remains steadfast in this, that, you know, you're not going to speak a word against my husband. Her steadfastness, despite the relocation of the film, makes an exemplary statement on the unchanging virtues inherent in an ideal team, irrespective of historical position. In the 1977 adaptation by the same name of the novel Swami, which means husband, we have the central character Sodamini, Shodamini. Her opposition to her husband is far more vehement than in the novel when he, she, when he asks her to seek his stepmother's forgiveness despite not having heard. She flatly refuses to do so with utter disregard for the duties as the elder daughter. Her abdication of social responsibility shows a headstrong nature far better than the novel does. She refuses to be uh, her mother-in-law's demand of her jewelry for safekeeping, having seen through her intentions. It is the same fiery nature that drives her to immediately pack her bags and leave her house, even if it meant going away with Narain, which is, which, who was, in a very strange way, her lover, uh, in a sense, with the entire family as onlook. Entire family is watching and she goes out of the house, uncaring. The fierce nature of Mini far outweighs Sadamini's and the film enforces her character traits in a far greater capacity than in the novel. So I'll come to a comment after which I'll conclude. Uh, the position of women in 19th century Bengal witnessed a departure in Shorachandra Pratipata's novels. He wrote his women as outspoken at a time when they were confined to their homes even as West Bengal was witnessing social movements for women's remarriage, education, and greater freedom. As the Hindi film adaptations prove, this has only been enhanced further. Devdas's heroines are exemplary of Chattopadhyay's women characters. Embodying traits like independence, passion, and strength, neither woman leans on Devdas for support. Paro is practical enough to marry a rich man, respecting her parents' decision, then waiting endlessly for her whimsical lover. Similarly, Chandramukhi exudes confidence and strength of personality, is financially stable and unapologetic of her profession. Vimal Roy's adaptation elucidates how Devdas leans on them for support, not the other way around. His Viraj Bohu seems at the outset a stereotypical woman suffering out of love and loyalty for her husband. Nevertheless, the continued sus sustenance of women, preyed upon by patriarchy through a relentless struggle for survival, exhibits proto-feminist glimmerings. In Majli Didi, Mukherjee portrays the educated Himangini continually resisting her in-laws, with Himangini testifying against her brother-in-law in court. The hypocritical walls of patriarchy are destabilized. In both Roy's and Pradeep Sharkar's adaptations of Parinita, Lalita is indistinguishable. Is distinguishable, sorry. Possessing strength of character and unapologetic of her actions, she demolishes social justice and hypocrisy despite abandonment by her lover. In Khushbu, the struggles of the three bold and brave Kusum, who chooses to write her destiny in her turn, is superbly rendered, with its composition dating back to a male author from the early 20th century. With Gulzar's filmmaking, Kusum's character acquires a distinguished identity. 
In that state, Sudhin Mishra subverts the literary source to give women their voice. Karo cannot be ensnared by a metallic barrier, nor would Chandramukhi devote her life to Dev. Mahaparism and tempering are always trying to be right. This is what Mishra says. Chani is in love with Dev, but she will still walk away with something for herself as well. Both women find their way, independent of the man they are. The heroines of both the author and the film adaptations refuse to be stereotyped. They exhibit resistance to the established gender norms and status quo socially prescribed for them. To conclude, perceptive and sensible, Chattopadha as an author champions women's rights within the limited territory of his creation, attempting to upgrade their social status. His initiative to voice concern against their prevalent social position simultaneously sensitive protections is supremely appreciated. Hindi cinema, as known to contemporary audiences, has added to the evolution of these women characters in their own right. With the evolution in society, the characters have undergone the same to be in symphony with the times. This is best reflected in the correctional attempt of the cinematic adaptations of these novels. Additionally, this also explains why, even in the 21st century and today, Chattopadha's uh, tales and characters sustain their relevance both in literature and cinema. Thank you. It's a nice presentation on the topic, uh, uh, Sonic uh, Dutta. Um, so here, uh, the observation on your paper, uh, books and uh, films, um, there is a, you know, a large difference between uh, texts and uh, films. Uh, because filmmakers have uh, directed uh, films uh, according to their um, no experience and uh, the audience um, no uh, the film lovers the movie lovers uh, expectations have to be filled um, so the directors have brought uh, some changes um, right so absolutely it, it is like uh, what i feel after having heard from you this adaptions um, from uh, books, I mean, film adaptions from books and uh, translation, uh, right? Or uh, in the same way, because when the translation is happening uh, from one language to another language, uh, the meaning is uh, changed um, no, n n uh, automatically. So in that way, uh, no, uh, these uh, films uh, from uh, books, um, right? I hope uh, uh, you would agree with me. Right? I would agree uh, so, with you, sir, because yeah, that's the yeah. politics of adaptation itself. Because you see, we have to cater to audience tastes. These are all commercial films. They have to sell. So, you know, the product, the market, uh, the commodity, all that comes in through the process. But interestingly, women are women's, uh, these alterations have also gotten to the women somewhere. And I see that in a, in a subtly positive light, at least, you know, it doesn't mean anything probably, but I still see it in some kind of optimism. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, anybody has any observation on uh, uh, the paper or a comment or any question? Uh, you are welcome to rise. I think uh, we don't have any question, uh, Datta. Uh, thank you. Uh, we can uh, move uh, towards the next uh, uh, paper presenter. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, paper presenters, uh, Dr. K. Maragadavel and uh, Sara Ilyana uh, Kuryakosh uh, from SRM, uh, Institute, of, Institute of Science and Technology, uh, Katan Kulatur, uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, the the research paper's topic is a study of labeling theory in the select autobiographical uh, points. Yes, uh, the research uh, paper presenter is uh, invited to present on the topic. Uh, thank you, sir. I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am, you are clear. OK, um, I'll be sharing my screen now. Uh, is it visible, sir? Uh, I hope I'm no, visible. No, no. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, screen is visible, but your okay. presentation is not visible. <coughs> uh, the slide is not visible? Yes, ma'am. No, not visible. Okay.
Uh, I hope it's visible now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, good evening to one and all. And my name is Sara Eliana Kuriakus. And I'm doing my PhD at Asaram University. Uh, the topic of my uh, paper today is the study of labeling theory in the select autobiographical poems. And the poems that I've selected are I Cut My Phallus by Kalki Subramaniam and The Kinaras of the World by Shilok Mukati. And both these poems talk about how they are being treated by the society for being a transgender. Okay, so as all of you know, transgender people are people whose gender identity is different from the gender they were thought to be at birth. Many transgender people face discrimination in the workplace and in the accessing uh, public accommodation, healthcare, etc. And in many places, they are not legally protected uh, protected from discrimination. So uh, my theory is uh, labeling theory. And labeling theory is when the behavior of a human being is influenced by the individuals in power. And those individuals in power label them as negative or deviant. So here the individuals in power is the dichotomous sex, male and female, and they label transgenders as uh, negative or deviant. The labeling theory suggests that people obtain labels from how others view their tendencies or behaviors. And each individual is aware of how uh, they are judged by others because he or she has attempted many different roles and functions in social interactions and have been able to uh, gauge the reactions of those present. Uh, so labeling theory uh, holds that deviance is not inherent in an act, but instead focuses on the tendencies of majorities to, to negatively label minorities or those who um, those seen as deviant from the standard cultural norms. Uh, Thomas J. Sheff's explanation of the concept of labeling theory in his jo journal, The Labeling Theory of Mental Illness, uh, 1974, has had a particular impact uh, in this in my project. So according to Chef, uh, what are generally referred, referred to as mental disorders or mental illness are actually a person's response to society rather than a problem on an individual level. Um, he goes on to say that uh, in many instances, uh, mental illness, illness isn't simply an illness which is caused by bodily malfunction, but rather uh, deviant contact or uh, social standard uh, breaches, which he refers to as residual deviances. So moving on to my poems, the first poem is Kalki Subramanian's I Cut My Phallus. So Kalki Subramanian is an entrepreneur, artist, poet, actor, and transgender uh, activist. Uh, she is the founder of the Sahodri Foundation, an organization that empowers, equips, and integrates transgender and uh, gender non-binary individuals. Uh, so in her poem, I Cut My Phallus, um, she says that other transgenders, including her, uh, is called as an error of nature because they do not fall under the category of the socially constructed gender. Uh, that is the gyno grammar you have created. As a basic assumption is that there are two and only two genders. We only know as with penis what the social construction of gender is grounded in for them rather than because he, is, he has short hair, he is a man. So gender does not shift, which is why a trans person must battle uh, medically, uh, mentally, and other institution who insist they can't be who they think they are without surgery. It is taken for granted views of a given social and cultural environment where only two genders exist, and one can confirm a person's gender by reinterpreting verbal and visual signs. Thomas J. Sheff proposes that a label uh, may have an effect on an individual's identity. Uh, to put it in another way, if anyone's label if anyone is labeled, uh, they will internalize the label and other to its meaning. So the society does not uh, really care about what the transgender think of themselves. Rather, they establish that they are a, a female or a male through the appearance and the way you talk. Uh, and moving on to the next poem is Shilok Mukati's Kinaras of the Dark World. Uh, Shilok Mukati is identify herself as a queer woman. And she's also a storyteller, performer. And she has been actively engaged in advocating for gender rights uh, and etc. So um, she says in a poem that, uh, but the fire of femininity is burning in the heart. Why should we die when there is no fault? In the roasting prison of manly bones, in the burning women, womanly soul. 
If a person does anything that is against their gender, it will have little to no impact on them until the society reacts. If the society rejects the trans, uh, gender transgression, however, that individual would be labeled as deviant and possibly mentally ill. So according to Thomas Sheff, um, what are generally referred to as mental disorder or mental illness are actually a person's response to society rather than a problem on an individual level. He goes on to say that in many instances, uh, mental illness isn't simply an illness which is caused by bodily malfunction, but rather deviant conduct or social standard breaches, which he refers to as residual deviance. Um, uh, the label have sucked like leeches, uh, bloody leeches do. The labels have swallowed and we curl as pythons do. It is because of these uh, labels created by society that they are being forced to live according to the label and curl themselves up to something they're not. This is the point where they have an identity crisis and feel that they are neither masculine sea of droppling seed or uh, nor the feminine nature giving breaches breaths, and the space and peace between them. Um, since transgender people do not adhere to the social roles assigned to their biological sex, they may be said to be violating gender norms. Society views non-transgender um, non-traditional gender practices as deviant. He said that uh, gender assignment is just as much a social construct as any other gender attribution. attribution. Uh, when a mem member of society goes against the grain, they are labeled as abnormal. This does not mean that the deviant individual is mentally ill, but rather uh, that they are acting in ways that are against the social norms. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, ma'am, for your uh, presentation on uh, labeling theory. You have particularly uh, brought out uh, the theory yes, on certain uh, poems of uh, third gender, or transgender. Yes. Uh, yes, in, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, any question is there on uh, this uh, research paper from the uh, participants? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, there is no question. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, well, you for the opportunity. Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, the um, I uh, the requisition for the admin uh, people uh, that uh, shall I uh, wind up this uh, session? I think only um, four research papers I was allotted. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the uh, the uh, admin uh, people for providing me this uh, mm -hmm. platform uh, to chair this uh, session. Thank you, everyone. Uh,